Do you see the slide desk? Yep. Okay. Please uh, interrupt whenever you are today. Again, a few um, yeah, rather academic concepts um, that they are, I think, important for what we do. Um, and we start, of course, with a beautiful uh, plant. And um, I, I'm, I'm not going to uh, tell you what it is, but uh, I'm asking who knows from those who have not been uh, in the team during the last few weeks. Any idea? Yeah, you know, of course. OK, so we, we're going to talk about it also later in the solution. Um, it's a tree that actually grows in our schoolyard. It's the largest tree in my school. Um, but it is also a tree that reminds me very much of China. Um, so we start with um, cognitive affordances. Um, maybe Lila actually uh, remembers. We were talking quite a bit about affordances. And um, cognitive affordances are a design feature that helps us um, to understand things in a more easier way. Um, we use post-its every day to write a note and put them maybe on a screen, a computer screen, and the result is that we, we see it. it we, it's just in front of us. So we, we take something out of our mind and put it into a physical space. The same happens with those key hanging boards. No? In order to not uh, lose the keys, we put um, a key hanging board, for example, on the door so that we have the keys always in a safe place. So we, we give the key um, a very significant um, position so we don't forget. This concept has been used in design for um, at least three decades, and it has been developed substantially uh, ever since we used the internet and websites. And there are four types of affordances. There's the functional affordance, there's the cognitive affordance, there's the physical affordance and there's the sensory affordance. Now, to just make one example that everybody knows, if you open uh, the Google website, then uh, you see the search bar and there is a magnifying glass there. This is a typical functional affordance that we use uh, in website design. Uh, you type any word into this bar and Google searches for you. And it, it is something that you do not need to explain. No, it's sort of um, it's common sense what, what it is. Um, good, so much to the cognitive affordance. So I did, I did some research and um, I was always talking about the Gibsonian affordance because I, I ran into this concept into one of uh, the psychology books that I read. Um, and actually, um, James Gibson is an ecologist. He's the founder of ecological psychology, uh, a very interesting subject. And uh, he wrote in 1979 um, a paper. And in this paper, he, he postpones uh, a radical hypothesis. And it is that the value and meaning of things in the environment can be directly perceived. So basically, evolution has designed things everywhere so that we can perceive them, and also, of course, other mammals, directly through our uh, perception, visual perception. Now, this is, a, is a, um, a, a groundbreaking observation because up till 1979, um, people were thinking about this very, very uh, different. They thought that um, things just, you know, they they happen. It's 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 um, it's it's random what we see in our environment. But you see here this graph, uh, and and the graph tells us that there is an individual seeing something, direct perception through this optical information. And the environment affords, and this is why he called it affordance, and later on it was called Gibsonian affordance, named after him, affords information that is crucial for our survival. Now let this sink in. This is super important. Everything we need to know to survive is in the environment. Um, let's take, for example, um, a frog that is poisonous will have a, a, a highly... Um, different color from the environment because it tells everybody that it is poisonous. So you know that you should not be touching it. That would be such uh, a Gibsonian affordance. 
And what he concluded out of this is that direct perception is the act of picking up information to guide action. Okay, so, so, so far to this. Now we, we come uh, into the 21st century and in the 21st century, our perception has changed significantly. The status quo of our perception is that we spend at average more than six hours of our waking time on the phone. So um, we need to conclude that we do not really look anymore into the environment. We look at the screen. So all the value and meaning that the environment might want to tell us, the affordance, is not being digested properly or we are not even able to perceive. Now, and I found online this, I found online this uh, guy, he's a South Korean designer. And uh, when, when looking to this screen time, he has recently designed a feature which he calls the third eye. So it is for people that are phone addicted so that they do not bump, for example, into a tree. So he has a small screen on the phone and this eye is kind of navigating <laughs> and telling him with a warning signal that there is uh, there is an obstacle. Watch out. Don't run into it. It, it is, of course, a bit sarcastic. He, he tries to also show with this uh, um, feature, with this design uh, item, that we are in a very addicted environment. But I just want to ask the question. So if, for example, uh, trees or anything else in our environment, in our natural environment, affords important information, but we do not perceive it anymore, um, what, what can we do about it? And this leads us to uh, our today's topic. Um, it's, another, um, it's another academic article that I found, a new, new word, um, cognitive salience. So what we try here ever since, but now we have also an academic description for it, is creating cognitive salience. Salience means, means that something springs out of the environment and is perceivable. Um, so we communicate nature's value and beauty using functional and physical affordances. Um, you see on the left side, this is a typical physical affordance, the Shimboku decoration. If you uh, put uh, a rope around a tree, like my two kids did it here in, in St. Pölten, then we, of course, see the tree. And although we might overlook it, usually, in this case, um, it springs into your eyes, and that's a cognitive um, salience. The same is what we do with the BFG cards. So the BFG cards, it's a tree that is somewhere in the forest, and we would completely overlook look it, because there are too many trees in the forest, but um, we uh, map it and then we uh, explain the ecosystem services and create a card and uh, even maybe a game out of it. And today, Lucas will show you what we try to do with maps. So maps are widely being used, but in the end, if you create maps about uh, nature monuments, for example, then you also create cognitive salience. And I mean, if you're interested in the academics behind it, I put the, the links in the slides and uh, you, can, you can read it up. So, and now making a connection to Geneva. Um, a few weeks ago, I found a super interesting article from the Swiss Academy of Sciences because we were in the process of creating uh, uh, a course that I can use in school on ecosystem services. And I ran into this article where uh, a Swiss team of scientists, um, they started in 2015 to work with ecosystem services. And they confirm in this article that ecosystem services are a viable method to communicate value of non-human organisms. So we, we know about ecosystem services. There's this general... Um, division into provisioning, supportive, cultural, and regulating on the left side. But the Swiss uh, scientists, they um, created this, um, this graph on the right side. And they say, well, there is a tree in the center. And 
we need to communicate the value of trees in our environment in a way that people really understand over time that we are dependent and they provide something to us that helps us to survive. Um, well, um, again, there is uh, the link to the article. And um, in the end, this is exactly what we do with uh, uh, mapping the trees and communicating the ecosystem service in a, in a playful manner. All right, so that was my introduction. Uh, now um, I hand over to Lucas, um, well, not yet actually, with uh, the new features. So we have today the community mapping. We have a nature monument import, facilitate activities, the student view for teachers, and we have made a little change to the BFG badges, um, how they are being awarded. And any questions? Because otherwise we jump into the app. Is it good? So Lucas, how do we want to do it? Should I jump into the app first? Yeah, I can go right with the first point. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Right, then let me reshare. Where is it? Share. Do you see my screen? Yep. Okay, so um, you know the main navigation. This is our crew call for today. Um, if you want to get your input points, sign up. Um, and what I show you now is a new feature that we have developed to uh, connect better to local organizations, because there are many organizations uh, in this small town where we are right now that are active in environmental education. And up till now, we only had a list. So this is the list that you might already know. Um, you see here, there's a filter on the right upper side and the filter <laughs> is just sorted by continent but you can sort it also by SDGs and you can sort it by the learning paths. Um, and you see here, this is my school. I teach now at this school. Um, and the list is a sort of, I mean, well, it, it fulfills a purpose, but it's easier if you have a map. And this is the map that uh, Lucas and Sonia and Mila created. Um, it's not all the organizations inside, but basically um, we are starting this and over the winter months, we hope to include a lot of local organizations. Um, I'm clicking now on green steps. And uh, what you see is immediately how many impact points the organization has created, how many people are part of it and which SDGs uh, do they put uh, forward. Um, this is another nonprofit I'm now engaged in with, and uh, you see it just started. And when you click on it, then you are directly then at the community page. And that's um, another cognitive salience that um, is created here online, of course, not in the real world. Okay, but now I hand over. All right. So. As you can see, we are utilizing our new uh, skills that uh, we gained with uh, making maps. We put the communities on the maps. Uh, it all started with the trees. And um, now we go very often out to map trees. Um, but um, when we want someone new or when someone new wants to start to work with the trees they have in their neighborhoods, uh, up till now, they had to start with an empty sheet. So you created the commons and you had uh, zero trees inside, um, which can uh, feel a little bit intimidating, maybe. So we thought about what can we do to uh, make start easier. And um, you might know that there is a concept of nature monuments, um, which are natural features of um, a uh, big uh, natural or uh, cultural importance. I don't know if this concept is everywhere. I know it's in here and in Czech Republic for sure. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. it, it, it is. Uh, it is a worldwide concept that spread basically in the uh, starting in the 19th century. Right. 
So what we did was we uh, had a look at the um, data website of the Austrian government. Uh, we took uh, the data about all the major monuments in uh, lower Austria. We filtered that for single trees and um, we found there was a problem. Uh, there was no species um, uh, in a machine readable format. So we have resolved to that problem um, using um, using a large language model. And so let's have a look now. Uh, how does that look? I'm going to share my screen. Can you see my art profile? Good. So let's have a look into commons. And um, we have created a new commons which holds all these trees, which is called the Royal Austrian Nature Monuments. And you can see it's immediately in the first place because it's got, it's got 498 specimens in it. Um, it is not our usual common size. Uh, it's covering the whole of Lower Austria. And uh, we can see it's got 498 specimens. So uh, that's quite a lot of trees for people to start with. Let's have a look at the map. Um, yeah. So this is the map visualization of Ooh. all the uh, all the specific all the nature monuments, trees, single trees, not alleys, uh, in Lower Austria. So I've just put a, a random picture because now this is the task for people to finish this up uh, with the measured information in field. So we've got the name that was given there. We've got the species. And we've got the, uh, the district or uh, local name of the place where it is. Yeah. Um, we've got a bunch of other data that is currently not visible, like um, what is the law that uh, made this uh, nature this tree into a nature monument. Uh, and uh, there are some linked uh, documents as well, some linked PDFs. But currently, the system of Lower Austria is broken, uh, so we couldn't utilize that. Um, but yeah, so that's it. This is the, the starting point. Um, now the next step that we need to take is that um, as you create a new commons, uh, you will have these trees in there automatically. So currently um, in, in the arc, the link is directly between the commons and the tree. So basically you need to first create the commons and only then can you link up the tree. Um, that's how it works in the background. So right now we are working on a system which uh, will do that uh, in a spatial way, which means the system will look into the shape of your commons and uh, automatically assign all the trees inside. Yeah, so that's um, we see this as a big step uh, to make people start uh make people start easier and uh, of course if you would like to import any any data into the arc and get in touch with us because currently we only did for lower austria but of course uh our goal is that uh, as you zoom out on this map uh it is all covered with um with specimens that we can learn about yeah and um maybe i i add to this so the trees are sort of um, human scale uh, landmarks that connect us to the planet. If this is everywhere, then we really have a sort of an internet of nature. And it, it, it's completely grassroots driven. If uh, um, Ellen would say, for example, I wanna do this for a district somewhere in Korea, then you just start there in a, in a territory that uh, is of a size that you feel capable of taking stewardship. Um, if Hans would like to do that in the in the Zurich area, then he could do the same. So it's you you define the size. It's not a, a large government entity telling you which size you need to work with. But you've taken the information from a Austrian from a website from a government website. Yeah. So maybe a bit of background information there. I've tried to get this information already in the very beginning when I moved here. There is a lot of uh, public databases on the city level, on the state level, on the national level. Um, it's usually all in proprietary uh, databases or software solutions. 
And um, this this is what Lucas uh, retrieved after we got in touch with uh, the responsible person in the state government. Yeah, so they pointed us to this data. We use this JSON format and uh, worked with it a little bit to get the names of the species. Uh, we actually used a plugin into Google Sheets, which is uh, able to feed information uh, from a single cell into um, into a OpenAI API. And so all of these species are guessed by a large language model, GPT-4, from this name. Yeah. So mm -hmm. there might actually be inaccuracies. But there was actually, I think, very nice uh, use case for for this kind of technology that is being developed right now. And um, then we just mapped it to our ARC species. I had to create maybe 15 species today uh, that we didn't have. And um, then I uh, created, uh, again, a format that can be inserted into the database and input that, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, so I, I really think that we're doing here something super, super innovative. Uh, not only that we use uh, AI, but we also help basically government data that nobody fully takes care of to be improved, because you need to think about it. There are 2000 nature monuments in Lower Austria alone, and the single trees that didn't even have the Latin scientific name attached to it. Lucas did this with this AI language model. Um, but on a, on a practical application, this is the way um, I started alone, actually, here. And then together with, with Gloria, we continued that we, we uh, analyzed the nature monuments. Those were our starting points, the large trees that have been already declared as a nature monument. And from those trees, those landmark trees, we then moved and started to map all the other old trees. And so this is really a, a first step that can help uh, all those grassroots communities that are interested in protecting the environment. Yeah. Hmm. That's really amazing. Uh, very glad to see this evolutionary step. I've got a little question, uh, which I don't really understand. So is JSON integration, is that bidirectional? So if you change information, this is going to be changed also on a database level, or how do you feedback uh, if there are something wrong or something should be um, added information? You mean into the original data source, yeah? Yeah. Um, so no, that's we just got a download file from them. And now basically I need to get in touch with them and uh, send them the updated data. OK, yeah. Yeah, and as you can see in here, they also list all applications that people made using this data. So I believe we should be appearing here soon. <laughs> Brilliant. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. This is really a very useful user interface. You're bringing basically this database to life. I imagine not that many people and applications making use of it. And this is, of course, uh, a pity. And by making it available, to everyday users, this is a, it's almost a miracle, I think. Yeah, well, well, we hope so, because this is information that needs to spread. It, uh, it, it must not uh, stay just within government hands. I mean, nobody is doing this willfully. Well, some organizations and institutions actually are happy to keep this data, especially on the city level. They do not disclose it. Um, mm -hmm. But I think many people actually want to share it, but don't know really how. Um, mm -hmm. Also, um, additional information. So through through being now basically also a, a formal teacher, um, we have been invited to participate in the state uh, environmental education network. So we will Green Steps will become an official organization, and that is then also a, a channel to give feedback for the state data. Okay, and another question I have is on the map, uh, having 
displayed these nature monuments, which are being initially generated by this government database, will it be visually distinct from uh, nature monuments, which are manually added by, by our ARC users, or is it the same gray dot? Well, uh, this is up to further thinking. We so far only thought to import them. I added the tag already as a nature monument because we did not have this tag. So uh, I think that we could think about um, at least showing it in the in the card in here. And definitely we will be adding some filters above the, mm -hmm. uh, on the top of the map. Mm -hmm. um, to... So it could be layers which you can click in and out. Yeah, uh, yeah exactly. depending on the different tags. Exactly. Yeah. If it makes sense to visually distinguish which ones were imported and which ones were added manually, this um, is for this we need to think about. Yeah. Um, this is currently the, the the color code in here is if it is gray, it means you have not observed it yet. You have not been at the tree. Uh, if I open the commons of Secproton, then I'm going to have um, many trees uh, in green. And the only thing that is communicating to me is uh, that uh, I've seen this tree. I've observed it. I've collected it into my profile. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, all, all your questions, Hans, I mean, we, we have, meanwhile, uh, an endless backlog and uh, hundreds of ideas. Actually, we have like three three months of full time work to just get the features done that we we think that we need. Um, it's related now to resources. Um, we we are not supported by the local government, and uh, we really need funding to to yeah integrate many necessary features to make this available. Yeah, we want to work more on the level of uh, eco-regions for uh, this kind of imported things where basically everything could be shown. Yeah? So there would be one more one more uh, section in here, eco-regions, which would be more about the species that are present in there. So maybe the, the type of species would move out from here into the eco-regions. Yeah. There are many, uh, many things in the pipeline that uh, we are slowly executing. Mm. But the most important feature related to this would be an interface that people can take, uh, for example, also Excel sheet or JSON file, no, from their local government, uh, whatever municipal state uh, level it is, or even national, and import it. Um, because th this is really then scaling uh, this uh, sort of internet of nature application. Um, that that's, that's quite pressing. Yeah. Mm. Good. So mm -hmm. I think we can move to the, move next, to the next one. Yeah. Next one. And if you could remind me what is the next one. Sure. <clears throat> the next one is um, facilitate the activities. activities. Okay. So a uh, very practical thing that uh, we've been getting feedback about for a while from people who organize activities on the ARC um, is that they don't have a uh, nice and simple overview of their facilitations, so the events or courses that they are organizing on their profile, on their homepage. So we have uh, modified this uh, card, which is right uh, under your main banner card of the upcoming activities. Um, there are now three ways to view it. The default is all, which would show you all your upcoming activities. Uh, including the ones that you facilitate and that you, the ones that you participate in. And uh, you can also only see the ones that you have booked, so your bookings. I haven't um, booked any activity. And only the ones that you are about to facilitate. So this is like an easy starting point for facilitators uh, to see what is on, the, on their schedule, on their agenda. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you're a teacher now like me and you run uh, four or five classes, that comes in, of course, really handy 
um, because I don't have to go to each single class. I just have a, a task list more or less. And Ellen said before that she thinks about doing the climate fresk. So we have actually, or actually Gloria, you have created uh, two best practices about climate fresk um, with additional facilitation information and also with the intention that we can track impact points. So they are in here and I'm gonna do it actually also during the winter months with my uh, older students. Um, so that would be one way to, to use this new interface of showing uh, what kind of activities you facilitate. This is one. This is one for children, where we created also additional uh, information on how to facilitate, and then we have the adult version. Yep. Good. So I think I can move to the next thing. Mm -hmm. I have only one question. Was this can I or later? Yeah, sure. Go ahead, Gloria. Go. Cool. What are the past activities then? Shouldn't they also be there, or you? Think... You mean your past facilitations? Yeah like past activities like if especially if you are yeah facilitator maybe that you want to look into them like quickly it's a good feedback it's not there fun. yet <laughs> okay. right now you can only see the past activities on the things you have booked yeah? mm -hmm. so you mm. just need to add the like this, yeah. this thing to to here yeah mm -hmm. and the past activities you can only see what you have participate in mm -hmm. feedback cheers thank you yeah the next thing would be the student view for teachers okay so i'm gonna take this one as well even though um probably knut is uh, the one who is using this the most um recently we have uh, been working a lot on the uh, features for schools and for managing school classes and um Let's have a look what it looks like. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to use the community of um, Sherwood Forest School, which is the ones, one that we organize our calls in. You can see that this is a school because it's got this classes card. Now, I am a teacher in this um, school. So when I click, let's say Marmots, uh, which is a glorious class in here, then I end up in the dashboard of this class where I can see all the stats about the learning and all the students' information. Um, what the students can see is what I now can also see with this button, go to students view. And that's a page which is very similar to the community page where uh, you can communicate with this, where communication between the students and the teachers is possible through posts. So this is what the students can see when they click on uh, the class in the school page. So you can uh, see the stats about the class and the impact points, and you can uh, create posts, which can be very handy for assignments. For example, uh, share a picture of uh, your nature journal that uh, you had to pay, uh, draw after last uh, walk. Yeah, so one of the last things that I did is I also teach one class biology and we, we actually have in sixth grade in Austria compulsory uh, to study the forests. So I, I gave them over the autumn holidays, I gave them the assignment to count uh, the branches of needle trees, um, Picea abies, and uh, define the age because it's one approximation to define the age. And I told them, well, whatever tree you have, take a picture, post it here in your class and write the age. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, they, they are in a digital environment and it, it worked quite well, but then I was not able to, to see it uh, unless I, I create the student profile. And uh, this is what Lucas resolved. Jelly me like, yeah. <laughs> Oh, Mila. Yeah, so that's it. Uh, one sing simple button uh, that takes you to the view that the students can see and uh, enables easy communication through posts. Well, some applause for Mila. Mila, that's Yay. the first real feature that I see that you do. 
Awesome. Good. So I'm very grateful to all this episode. Yeah. Good. Yeah. For this one. Good. So what is the last thing that we want to show? Or is it the, the last, last thing? thing is then the BFG badge. Right. So maybe I open the, mm -hmm. the badges and the group can talk about it. So we we did some updates uh, in the in the gamification. So I just need to change my. So uh, Gloria, maybe actually you take this. It was also your suggestion that we change the levels. Uh, can you just explain again the levels of the of the game? Yeah, sure. So you got a level one after ten observations of BFG. You got a level two after 50 observation, you get to level three. If you get 100 observation and you do 10 mappings, then you can get level four with 300 observation and 30 mappings and level five with 500 observation and 50 mappings. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so like the first two levels are quite low in the way that people are uh, can see a result like after a few observations already and they are a bit pumped to continue to get up on the levels <laughs> yeah yeah so trees. <laughs> so we lowered we lowered the thresholds um and it's now an easier start which seems to be more um more motivating yeah yeah which level am i actually <laughs> i'm level two Apparently, yeah. I need to. Uh, you need to work harder, Lucas. Computer. <laughs> <laughs> and this is mapping level three. And these mappings refer to making the 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 routes. That if you go and you have um, like a route to go and see maybe whatever five, ten, fifteen trees, that would be one mapping. Is that right? Yeah. So basically, when you are using the app, it, it refers to adding specimens to to the app. Yeah. So you can do it uh, in the commons interface. And when you are on the go, we have created this uh, tool called mapping tool. It's in the top right of the mm -hmm. screen. Uh, and uh, this basically helps you to map trees on the go <laughs> using the location data from, from your phone. Yeah. So. Oh, so one, so if you record or map one, species that's one mapping one species yeah. exactly yeah. ah okay yeah creating right. the routes would be the step forward but it's not necessary to get up on the level ah i see ah, so one mapping refers to one just one, yeah. one species yeah, exactly mm -hmm. so basically right. you create it in here then mm -hmm. you come back home you open the arc on the computer or uh, so that you have a bigger screen and uh, inside of the commons, where, where you currently are, uh, you can find the specimens that uh, you have created in uh, in here. Uh, it's it's gonna be in uh, in my drafts. And now you finalize it. That is just some testing. Yeah? You finalize it with all the data that um, uh, that is still missing, like some description of the nature and culture. And then you submit it for a review. Then the Commons mentor will do the review. Maybe he'll ask you to do more. Um, I hope that you will be very happy and um, approve it. And uh, then the tree appears on the map, and uh, other people can go and observe it. Yeah. Okay. So in my case, uh, as I am a, a one-woman show here, um, who is my mentor? Who should I uh, contact as as a mentor then? What right. do you think? Somebody else in Asia, I like Joanna, who who would be the my yeah, point of contact? Yeah, so basically it can really be uh, be anyone who is in the same commons. Yeah? So of course this is a huge case that uh, is a little bit uh, difficult uh, in this way. We, we always fought to make it like at least at least two people. So I mean a mm. good way is to contact anyone. Like Gloria, for example. Yeah. Can it can also be Joan? Yeah, if uh, he's more uh, he's more familiar it, with. Uh, with it doesn't have to be with you physically anyway. Like it just needs to be part of the common. 
Now, so if you created the columns, then then the movie you in here, you, you have the people tab. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, you need to add the person into the mentors. Uh, so you edit in here and you mm -hmm. uh, add a mentor and uh, add the person that uh, uh, is working on this with you. And um, then this person uh, is able to do the, the, the reviews. In, in the specimens here. And there is a, okay. there, okay, after you submit it for review, it is in here under review. Somebody needs to pick it up if it is to review. And mm. uh, yeah, then uh, basically people are rewarded with uh, impact points for creating that specimen. And that specimen can be used to create the routes, which can be either the quests, we are with quizzes and QR codes, or it can be a guided route, mm. which is uh, then uh, visible also in the library. Okay, thanks. Yeah. yeah. I think we are working now on the, on the video about the whole process as well. We have some videos on mappings, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So I think that was it from the new features today. Yeah. Okay. So um, then maybe I do a, a quick recap and um, then we, we do um, a sharing and question round. Okay. So Uh, recap, so we, we, we showed you the community map, basically cognitive salience for sustainable communities in your region, show which SDGs you're promoting, then we showed the nature monument import, a very, very crucial uh, uh, functionality, which is definitely the focus of today's sharing, An easy start for commons to build the internet of nature, and cognitive salience for trees and other nature elements, so we definitely have the plan to also continue with um, um, non-tree nature elements that are important for our survival, like for example, swamps. Um, then the student view for teachers, which provides a better integration for schools and pupils in the project and really helps um, to turn the arc into a, a pedagogical tool in schools. Um, yeah, so some, some, some discussion maybe. Well, um, I, I mentioned that uh, next week I have a meeting with the German kindergarten here, and so uh, I will see whether you know what their interest, what the level of interest is, uh, in becoming um, a um, a member. That would be my first, uh, yeah, my first uh, community here in Seoul, uh, yeah, um, outside the one that I've created. So um, let's see whether there's a level of interest, and it's uh, yeah, so it's. Uh, Good for me to to know and have a, a sort of an update of where you are up to and, and what's all you know what's possible because then we could talk about it so you can have a a view because there's not much in Seoul yet but of course uh, you know the, the potential is is so big so yeah so I look forward to seeing how that goes next week yeah Ellen maybe also a, a pedagogical feedback I mean what we do now is not suitable for kindergarten age it's not even suitable for uh, elementary school. Um, so the way the art could be used is by teachers, that they basically use the library and create routes. Um, but mm -hmm. it, we basically start at age 12 to let children use the ARC on the mobile phone. Oh. We mm -hmm. do not promote earlier than that, that they work with this on their own. It, it might be very useful for the teachers because it helps them to go outdoors and have an easier mm -hmm. access to nature. Um, so, so just as for, for you, that ah. you have a good starting point on how to talk to them. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Mm. We have mm -hmm. been working before three years with uh, uh, elementary school here. And even at that age, we created a route in their school garden, but we do offline quizzes. So you can scroll through the, the BFG best practices that we have created. There is always mm -hmm. an offline quiz. Maybe Gloria can share one afterwards. 
And the offline quiz is very suitable for, for the elementary school level. But for kindergarten, it also doesn't make sense, no? It's a, you, you know what we did in, in Shanghai uh, together with John on the kindergarten level. And it mm. is just completely non-digital. Yes. Yeah, true. Mm. 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 Yeah. But, I mean, it, that's still um, uh, something, of course, that uh, that could be of interest. You know, so that uh, they might want to use that because they go out uh, to the forest uh, weekly, and um, they might do other things that I don't know about. So um, we'll, we'll discuss that. And of course, they uh, not of course, but the uh, German kindergarten is also right next to the German school. So I don't have many contacts mm -hmm. to the school. But he does. So um, yeah. So that's for us to to just yeah. This is an initial chat to see what what the scope of the cooperation could be. So. Yeah, I think it's super important that we also kind of uh, keep uh, exchanging on this. I mean, I'm working now in a school campus. So there are three schools. There is a secondary school, 10 to 14. Then there's a primary school, basically 6 to 10. And then there is a special school for handicapped children. And mm -hmm. um, so what I'm trying to do now is creating not only in the school garden a route. So we have almost completed that route already. And then we also do two routes that are in the neighborhood. And mm. this is extremely interesting for the elementary school children. It might be also interesting, a very short route for the kindergarten if the teacher wants to go outdoors, because it's more this kind of plants and friends uh, format. No, you go to three, four trees and you observe what is there, which bugs, um, what, what kind of flowers, what can you pick up? So it, it is it is very different. It just gives a guidance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fair enough. Mm. Mm. I have to go soon. My break over. But I was going to see how the use improving. Can you can you repeat? We don't hear you. Um I have to go, my lunch break's over, but it was good to see. I think the usability of the app is improving and it's, yeah, it's good to see. Also, I'll be going to a new bioregion soon. I'm going to Iceland in February. So that's, um, that's something. So yeah, I'm saying goodbye now. Maybe soon again. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, Bye Lila. Bye. Okay, Hans, um, maybe I, I share afterwards the article with you because it was oh, yeah. a study done um, by a, a Geneva-based uh, team and they actually analyzed Geneva. So that was the, the focus of the project. Uh, and they came to this conclusion that ecosystem services are super important. Yes, very good. Thank you. And also thank you for the reminder for the routes. I, I really think that's a good way to engage uh, schools, these kind of groups. Yeah. Okay, that was it for today. Um, if there is nothing anymore on your mind, then I, I, I think... I have just a quick question, Knut, uh, that, but it's, it's not really... Well, it's sort of related to here, but you introduced in the last session in October... You uh, mentioned a book. I don't think you introduced it, maybe, but you mentioned a book on uh, trees. Could you share that information with us? I think it was Mythos Bäume or something like that. Yeah. So you find it. You find the book actually in most of the of the link collections. Um, I can do this right now. Um, I think the author is Doris Laubert. Um, so if you go in here into um, uh, St. Pölten or any mm -hmm. European broadleaf forests. Um, and then there is species and all categories, tree, shrub. Mm -hmm. Gloria, which one? London plain should be one? No, uh, no the one that you did, probably the Quarkus or- the Common oak should be one. Definitely, yeah. And here you see Doris Laubert, Mythos mm -hmm. Baum. Oh, yeah. Mythosbaum, okay. Yeah, she, ah, she, thank she you. has already died, but she wrote in the 80s uh, a, a few books where mm -hmm. she integrated a lot of 
um, mythological knowledge on trees, and it's fascinating. Mm. It's it's also very lovely to read. It's it's rare to find a book on trees that is so easygoing to read. Um, and she describes, I think, the 50 most common trees of Central Europe with the entire history, a lot of uh, pictures from the archives. And actually we have used many of those here. So if you go to culture, mm -hmm. the, you see parts of the book. So this is, for example, um, a picture, a medieval picture on how um, the farmers in the past um, led the pigs their, their flocks of pigs into the forest, especially into the forests of oak trees, because if pigs were fed on oaks, they would become very fat. So there was like a oak fed pig is better than a beech fed pig. And all this knowledge that we lived up till the 19th century in a, in a forest dominated culture is in this book. It's beautiful to read. Um, and we have actually copied and translated um, many, many parts of that book for the most most common species uh, on the ark. So it's it's already all online, a lot of it. Mm -hmm. OK, uh, great. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I hadn't found that before. So I've just ordered a book, um, but it's a different one. But it ha also has um, a lot of sort of like the natural history, the cultural history of of uh, trees. Well, so, I think um, that's a, a Christmas present that, that uh, I will get when I go to Germany over Christmas. <laughs> yeah, it might be good for your forest school training because the Anglo-Saxons, it seems, have less of this uh, of these publications. It's really something very German, German speaking. Oh, OK. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Good. Should we? Quiz, quiz, quiz. Oh, quiz. Thank you for the reminder. Gloria, you <laughs> want to do it? You created the entry in the arc? <laughs> yeah. Can we see the picture again? Yeah. Yeah. Apt. Apt. Well, it, it's a meta sequoia. Glyptus truboides. Yeah. Uh, Down redwood. Yeah, so it's actually a um, fossil species which was believed to be extinct until the beginning of the last century. And then it was found again by some researchers a bit randomly in some little area of China, which I don't know exactly where. Um, the... yeah, it was found in Sichuan. And um, yeah, mm -hmm. um, I, th I think shortly before Second World War. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's actually a very interesting species because it's not only fossil, but it's also... It, it loses the leaves during winter, like it mm -hmm. turns red and then it loses the leaves and this is quite, uh, it's very uncommon for conifers. And uh, I mean, in, in yeah. Europe, we have a large that does these mainly. And uh, yeah, and this is like an Asian plant. We have very quite beautiful. a lot here in Seoul as well. Uh, yeah, I can, can understand, yeah. I mean, right now they are planted a lot in gardens, like for, yeah, for make beautiful gardens, but, the original plant, like in its original uh, location, is almost extinct. I mean, it's uh, it's very protected, very much protected. Yeah. So you see here, it's uh, in in Hubei, uh, Chongqing, Hunan provinces. This is where they have found uh, a few, mm -hmm. um, like native endemic. Everywhere else, it is more or less. Yeah, just planted later on as uh, for gardens. But it's the largest tree in my school garden, and it reminds me very much also of uh, Tsempotsun, which I, I still kind of um, am nostalgic of, because the, the, the Chinese water fir grows there in a few parks, um, like really underwater. So it's also one of the few trees that can really sustain constant flooding. Um, so yeah, it's lovely. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. So then uh, I think we're we're good to conclude the call. Looking forward to see you again. Uh, next call would be on December seventeenth. Thank you very much. It was very informative and exciting.
Good to see you. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye everyone.